Hi, I'm Dr. Andy Aldrin. I'm director and founder of the ISU Center for Space Entrepreneurship at Florida Tech. I'm Robbie Boundy, founder of Space Impulse. Hi, I'm Ran Kedar. I'm CEO of Space Product Innovation. And I listen to the Cold Star Project. And I listen to the Cold Star Project. And I'm listening to the Cold Star Project. Instead of hitting the target, the Germans were dropping their bombs out in the countryside. And Churchill had a political problem there when loads of German bombs came raining down on farmers. He couldn't tell the farmers that, well, we sent the bombs there because we didn't want them to hit the city. Welcome back to the Cold Star Project. I'm your host, Jason Canigan, the founder of this thing, Cold Star Technologies, a machine learning and business process improvement firm. We help make good companies better. And I am here with Major Bruce Gordon, obviously retired, but uh, you're going to be excited about why I wanted to have him on. I found Bruce. Uh, th the thing is, as you get into the study of space and satellites and that antennae become quite important and then um, if you have a brain you start studying electronic warfare <laughs> and there's no, there's no real way around it. I had to find some books and watch some videos and uh, so I downloaded things and started reading and teaching yourself is one of the, the most fun things uh, at least I think uh, a guy can do and uh, I ended up finding Bruce's channel here on YouTube where he was kindly explaining uh, some history and some uh, facts about uh, the development of electronic warfare. And also at the same time, I had discovered the Battle of the Beams, which is what we're gonna discuss because I had been looking at Steve Blank and Steve Blank had written something called The Secret History of Silicon Valley and gone into the development of many of the uh, radar equipment and that, um, that we're gonna, look at this is going to probably be a two-part series we'll see how it how it goes but uh he he had pointed out that many of the young students today uh who are graduate students and that you know and they're in their young 20s and that did not know why the names of certain buildings at universities were named after these people they didn't they didn't know uh and so what i wanted to do was bring the history uh to life and Bruce here has a really great connection to it. He, he actually met somebody uh, who, was, who was integral to this. And so I, I had to have you on, Bruce. Um, we're gonna get into Bruce's history. Uh, he's gonna have a presentation about this and then we're gonna get into how did this electronic warfare uh, subject begin? Um, I had, through my own study, discovered that it had begun in World War II. And then, of course, following the Steve Blank example um, by myself, went, I asked myself, uh, wait, what about further back, right? Did, did, was this going on around 1900 or 1910 or 1920 or what? And I started finding some answers. And that's how I found out about the Battle of the Beams, Bruce, and, uh, and Reginald Jones. And so by the time that I got to your content, your videos, I, my ears went, whoop. I know what this is. <laughs> I know who this is and I need to have Bruce on. So thanks a lot for agreeing to do this. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Jason. All right. So after that long winded opening, <laughs> I do believe that we're here to uh, educate folks about the history of electronic warfare. So I'm going to hand it over to you. You're going to do some screen sharing and, uh, and hey, let's, let's see where it takes us. Okay. Thank you very much, Jason. I'll share my screen here. Okay, I'm Bruce Gordon. I had a 20-year Air Force career, uh, 15 years as a fighter pilot using radar and infrared. And so I had personal experience with electronic countermeasures and electronic countermeasures. And I um, flew, later in my career, flew 132 combat missions in Vietnam in the F-100. The F-100 is really not the subject of my briefing today. Rather, I will talk about the ECM and ECCM. I started out in the F-86L, which was one of the earliest radar interceptors that we had. And we had a contact range of around six miles on a bomber-sized target. And then I went into the F-102, which had about a 15-mile contact, 
And we also got into electronic countermeasures where people could be jamming us and then electronic counter countermeasures. And the F-106 was really great in electronic counter countermeasures. So after all that experience, I went and taught uh, ECM and electronic countermeasures at the electro electronic warfare SPO system program office at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And I have written uh, a book on it called The Spirit of Attack, uh, Fighter Pilot Stories. And I'll just show you just a picture of that. It's a very small uh, little book. If you want that, it uh, costs only $20 if you send it to me at 105 Broadbill Court in Georgetown, Kentucky, 40324. Now you can buy it for $10 more by going to Amazon, if you'd like to go to Amazon and pay $10 more. But uh, I suggest you just send that to me. So let me go back here and we'll, we'll talk, I guess I'll, we'll talk about the electronic warfare. As I taught that class in electronic warfare, I wanted to look at where it began and in 1904, the Russians jammed Japanese radar signals. That was the very first electronic warfare that we know of. Now, let me, the story on that was that after the Battle of Tsushima, the remains of the Russian fleet fled to various bases in China, bases that the Russians had as treaty bases, and the Russians had some short artillery that were dangerous to Japanese ships coming in. So the Japanese battleships stayed outside of the range of those Russian guns, and they sent some small ships that were fast, maneuverable, hard to hit, in close. And the ships that went in close were traveling at high speed and they would use their, uh, electric, their dots and dashes uh, sending code. Actually, it was a version of Morse code, but it was for Japanese. And just send dots and dashes back to the Russian German battleships pardon me, Japanese battleships, and corrected their fire. So they were going in there and the battleships were pounding the Russian positions. And a Russian radio operator heard the dots and dashes from the Japanese, and he added his own dots and dashes to it so that the Japanese signaling da, 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 and he just added his own in there and completely followed up the Japanese naval signals going back to their battleships. And that is the first recorded instance we have of an electronic countermeasure jamming their signals. Now in World War I, not much happened. Not much happened at all. There was some uh, listening to it and a little bit of trying to jam it, but nothing serious. Now, in World War II, it really started. And there was a man, Reginald Jones, the father of ECM, we call him. He wrote two books. You can still find them on Amazon, The Wizard War and The Most Secret War. Now, I actually had an opportunity to meet Reginald Jones. In the 1970s, I was assigned to write Patterson Air Force Base. And one of my jobs was to meet a British electronic warfare man who was going to come and speak to the Air Force about electronic warfare. My job as a simple 
officer was to go out and meet him at the airport, uh, take him to lunch, make sure he had everything he needed, get him set up with his uh, room for the night. And, and at lunch, we sat down and we had some time, more than an hour, to sit before he had to go to talk to the Air Force official. And he told me about electronic warfare. He told me some things I didn't know. For instance, he said, uh, did you know that the Americans built a V-1 buzz bomb? You know, the V-1s that attacked London? I said, no, I didn't know that. And he said, oh, yes. He said that the British had captured a German buzz bomb, it crashed without exploding, and they sent it to the US. And the idea was that if we could build a buzz bomb that looked like a buzz bomb on the outside, we could, when the Germans sent a buzz bomb toward London, we could fire one of these others back and tell the Germans that we had figured out a way to turn around their buzz bombs. And, and they would then say, well, if the buzz bombs are coming back at us, we'll stop sending them. So that was one idea. And they gave the buzz bomb job to the Ford Motor Company, which went down to Florida and we built a buzz bomb. It, could, it had to look like a German buzz bomb on the outside, but on the inside, it could be all American. So we tried to build a buzz bomb that looked like the German buzz bomb. And we built them and we fired them, but our buzz bombs didn't work. The German buzz bombs worked, ours didn't. So we were struggling through that and we never got them completed in time, but this was, and the matter of fact, the buzz bomb that we developed was later developed into our first cruise missile, the Regulus missile that we could have fired from submarines, for instance. But this was one of the ideas of Reginald Jones. And then he began to tell me about the Battle of the Beans. And I had heard a little bit about the Battle of the Beams, but I was surprised I was sitting there talking to the man who did it. Now, the situation was that he had been a, well, he was a very young scientist working for Cambridge University. He was a undergraduate, well, he was a graduate professor, not a professor, but a graduate assistant at Cambridge. And the Royal Air Force asked Cambridge if they had a really good scientist that who could work on infrared for it. And Reginald Jones had already won some accolades for his work. And so they told the RAF that right, here's Reginald Jones. So they got him and one of his colleagues and gave them a flat and a building and told them to work on infrared. No one knew what it was. And he actually developed in that lab, starting from scratch, he developed an infrared system that he could detect a matter of fact, they flew it out in another airplane, two light airplanes flying together, and he could detect another aircraft in the air with infrared back in 1934. I couldn't believe how long ago they had infrared detecting aircraft. And the RAF thought he should be working on infrared. But about this time, the war was going, and German bombers were coming over at night and bombing British cities. And they were, jargon, 
accurate, surprisingly accurate. And the British bombers bombing Germany were remarkably inaccurate. How were the Germans navigating across England, blocked out, and finding their targets so well? And Reginald Jones was looking through some pictures taken by tourists, and on the top of a building in Germany, he saw an antenna. And the antenna looked very much like one that the Germans were developing for making an instrument landing system to be able to land airplanes in the weather in Berlin. But this antenna was larger, and it wasn't pointed toward an airport. It was indeed pointed toward England. And he began to wonder, is this how the Germans are navigating to England at night? And he wrote a letter to Winston Churchill. Back in those days, Winston Churchill actually got letters and read them. And he said that he felt that the, the Germans were using beams to guide themselves over England. And Winston Churchill called his RAF aide and said, well, send this guy and see what he can find. So Reginald Jones and his buddy drove all around England with a radio receiver trying to find the German beams and they couldn't find them. So Reginald decided that because they are a fairly high frequency, they would not bend with the curvature of the earth and therefore the beams would be above the ground and that you couldn't detect them from the ground in England. So he, he, what he needed was an airplane to go up looking for these signals during a German air raid. And he asked the RAF for it, and they said, get lost. We have other things to do than chase your little electrons. So he wrote another letter to Winston Churchill and said, I need to go up there and I need the RAF to give me an airplane to go up there and find it. So the RAF finally gave him a two seater, but they were both RAF people. And Reginald Jones gave the back seater a radio receiver and he had to guess what target the Germans might be bombing that night. So it was very fortuitous that he actually guessed the right target because they would be aiming the beam at different targets. So the British plane went off at night and this is therefore the first electronic intelligence mission flown in an aircraft. So this British plane two-seater went up in the middle of a German air raid and doggone if they didn't find the radio beams just as Reginald had said they would. And then he had to figure out how they were doing. So this is how they did it. This is, became called the Battle of the Beams. The Antenna down here, you can see in the lower left of the screen, was aimed at England, okay? And it had two beams. It was, the, the antenna was not straight. One side of the beam sent out dots, and one side of the beam sent out dashes. Now, if a plane came along here, and was tuned in to this frequency. If he was over here, he would hear dashes, 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 dashes. And then he gets into here and he starts 
the dashes start, you get the dots filling in the holes between the dashes. And then as he gets on it, it's a strong signal. Now he knows the direction of the beam as it's going out. They've told him that in briefing, so he knows the direction it's going, but the wind he doesn't know. So the wind could be blowing back off. He's got here, and if he blows off into the dash zone with the wind, the, he'll hear dashes again. So he turns back to the left until he gets back in the dots and continues on out to the target. Now, how does he know when he gets to the target? <clears throat> Well, he needs a cross beam. So he builds a second beam that goes across it from another place in Europe. And again, with dots and dashes, on a different frequency. Now, the pilot would have one radio dialed in, and he's following the dots and dashes to follow the beam as he's going out. And the bombardier would be tuned into the other frequency from the other one that's coming over this way. And when the, the bombardier would be hearing, say it's all da dots here, he's hearing dots, 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 but then it builds up. And when he hears the solid tone, he's on the beam at that moment, he's over the target. He drops his bomb. Very simple. So Reginald told Churchill that what we need to do is build jammers for this. So they built a number of jamming stations in England that would put out dots or dashes in the British, uh, they would send it from England, and they were much closer than the German signals. So the British, it was not hard for the British signals to be much stronger than the German signals. And using those beams, they were able to bend the beam so that the, and they didn't want the Germans to know that they were doing it. So they didn't do it too strongly. If the Germans knew they were doing it, they would find some way to get around it. So they did it kind of gently and bent the beam. And instead of hitting the target, the Germans were dropping their bombs out in the countryside. And Churchill had a political problem there when loads of German bombs came raining down on farmers. He couldn't tell the farmers that, well, we sent the bombs there because we didn't want them to hit the city. And the farmers might not get along with that very well. So this was kept quite secret. But it then progressed to many other things. The Germans were beginning to build their own radars. They had the British radar. Uh, they knew about the British chain home thing now, and they were building their own radars to detect our missions going against them. We knew they had to be doing it, and pretty soon we were able to pick up some of their frequencies and know that they were homing in on us. They were picking us up, but what did they look like? What was their capability? What was their technical capability? So following from several beam angles on the radar, which he was able to get again through intelligence, he was able to find a transmitting antenna in France, on the coast of France. And it was fortunately, fairly close to the coast. And so they arranged for a commando team to attack this 
German radar station. The commandos went in at night and they did encounter some serious resistance from German forces. But the commandos got in there and took apart uh, large portions of the radar and brought it back to England, where Reginald was then able to examine the German technology and see what they were doing. Now, about this time, we got into the magnetron. The battle beams continued, by the way, in various versions. But the British radar originally had big low frequencies and big antennas. You couldn't fit those onto an airplane. The British scientists, I don't think it was Reginald, but this was some other ones, were developing the cavity magnetron. A number of magnetrons had been developed to generate radar waves, but they transmitted fairly low frequencies, which meant big antennas. The British had developed a working um, cavity magnetron, which could give higher frequencies and smaller for, uh, which would allow smaller radar, smaller antennas. And, but the British couldn't develop it. They, did, they had a war going on and they didn't have the resources to develop this magnetron and test it. So even before America got into the war, Churchill gave the order and the British put their working model of a ma cavity magnetron into the suitcase of one of their men and they flew back to the U US, went back to the US. I don't know if he flew my gun by ship, but he went to Boston and gave the cavity magnetron to MIT, our Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And the MIT technicians took the cavity magnetron and put it on the roof of a building in MIT. And it was there that the cavity magnetron was fully developed. Once it was fully developed, you could put it on planes uh, and we use it to find submarines. That was a big action against submarines. It was one of the things that really stopped the German submarines when we could find them by radar from our bombers, our patrol bombers. They got it smaller and they put a radar, a small radar, in the tails of bombers to detect German fighters. Now the British are flying over Germany and the Germans are tracking the British on radar and the British put this radar in there to detect and let the tail gunner, it wouldn't aim the tail guns, but it would tell the tail gunner that he was being attacked and just about where this guy was. So he would be looking in the right direction at night to see the German fighters coming in. But as they looked at their statistics after a while, they were putting this on some bombers and they didn't have enough of them. So some bombers didn't have it, but the ones that had this radar were losing more planes than the ones that didn't have it. This was not expected. And then a German fighter, night fighter, crash landed in England. And as Jones went over the wreckage of the German night fighter, he discovered a strange receiver. And because he had the eye for what it was, 
he determined what f that it was set to the same frequency as the tail guns of the British bombers. And he determined that the Germans were using that to home in on so that they could home in on the British bombers. That was a electronic countermeasure of great significance. The Germans and Japanese were using mostly codes. As I say, the Germans did have radar and the Japanese had radar. They weren't as good as what we had done. That work at MIT on the cavity magnetron gave us a significant jump, but the others were working on it too. And the Germans had their Enigma machine, which I'm sure you heard about, the Beschley Car Park code breakers were able to finally break the code. It took a long time, and that's when they were developing the first computers to try to break the code. The US broke the Japanese code, as we know, the Japanese diplomatic code, and were able to tell that the that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked, but of course, we. That's a long story about how we didn't react. And we broke their naval code. And that was where we found that they were going to attack Midway before they actually attacked it. And you've all heard those stories, but you might not have heard about the cargo vessel codes. The Japanese bureaucracy required every cargo vessel to report to Japan once a day, giving its position. Oh, they thought that because cargo vessels were not warships, they were not too terribly worried about this code. And we broke it quite easily. And, and as a result, we were able to tell where all the cargo vessels were in Japan and when they formed up in convoys to go across the Pacific to resupply their places. So while we couldn't really read their naval code that well, we could easily read the cargo vessel codes. And we began to send our submarines out there. We said, oh, this freighter is moving from here to here and I think they said sometimes what their cargo was so we knew what kind of cargo they had on board and our submarines were able to sink a great many Japanese cargo vessels because we had broken the cargo code and by the end of the war the Japanese merchant marine had been destroyed and Japan was approaching starvation. Now, we were going after German submarines with sonar. Do you all know that? The beeps going out and coming back. So the Germans developed something called the Pillenwerfer, or we call it the Pill. And the Pillenwerfer would fit into a torpedo tube. It was a ball that fit into a torpedo tube. And it had come compressed air in it. <clears throat> and when we were attacking a German submarine using sonar, the Germans would spit out this pill. And the pill would slowly sink. And as it gave, as it sank, it gave out bubbles that sounded just like German submarine propellers so that we would hear on our sonar we would hear the german submarine propellers at that place and we would drop depth charges on the pill the pill was effectively the same as chaff chaff was also 
developed with the help of Reginald Jones. And at first it was, he had it in fairly long strips. It turns out that to reflect a radar signal at a given frequency, the chaff, the, at first thought, the chaff had to be the same length as the radar frequency. And being as they were using low frequencies at first, very low frequencies, the chaff was quite long. As a matter of fact, we called it rope. I haven't heard the word used in 40 years now, but we called it rope. And I was a little boy in Honolulu when a, one of our B-17s flew over and he dropped a long stream of tinfoil. I re remember seeing it come down. We were out in the playground. All these things happen in schoolyards. You can't, all these weird things happen in schoolyards. But I was there in the schoolyard and we looked up and this B-17, of course, we always looked at B-17s, and he dropped this long stream of tinfoil that came slowly falling down and by golly, it fell very close to our schoolyard. So I actually got to see some of this rope as it was being developed. We also determined though, that it doesn't have to be the full length of the radar frequency. It can be a fraction of it and it will vibrate when, it, when the radar hits it. So that if you have it the right frequency, it could be much smaller. And then we were able to make chaff that was really useful. Oh, one thing with this rope also, when they dropped it, over various places in testing it. In one case, the rope fell across some high powered lines, tra high powered transmission lines, and shorted out the electricity for a city. And another thing, uh, and also the, as we were dropping this chaff, we got lots of complaints from our pig farmers because the darn pigs would eat this stuff and it would really gum up their intestines and our farmers raised holy hell over the chaff that we were dropping. So we soon had restrictions on it. But anyway, we found we could make it shorter than uh, the frequency. It had to be, a, uh, we had to know the frequency but the Germans weren't changing their frequencies very often. So we could cut the chaff to the proper size for the German radars. And we packaged it in little packages called bundles. So we had bundles of chaff. And in a famous first attack, the British, I believe it's British, forces one in at night and drop chaff. Now, it, it turned out, as we go back through history, that the Germans in their work on radar had also discovered chaff, but it had so completely fouled up their radar that they kept the existence of it, or even the idea, a top secret, because they didn't want the British to find out about chaff. Well, they didn't think about the British finding it out on their own. So the Germans, keeping it top secret, did not tell their radar operators that such a thing existed. And so on the first British attack into Germany using chaff, the Air defenses were absolutely astounded. And the famous quote from a German radio operator was, 
the enemy are reproducing themselves. Each bundle of chaff looked like another bomber. And he said, the enemy are reproducing themselves. So my next time I'm gonna talk about ECM in the Cold War, I'm gonna get into a lot of technical details. It's gonna be a lot more technical. I'm gonna talk about our methods, infrareds, lasers, about directional jamming, where you can make the enemy or multiple targets. You can put multiple targets on the scope, make false targets. We can make it so his missiles get thrown off and go in the wrong direction. These are things I'll talk about in the next issue. Thank you, Jason. Awesome. Well, Bruce, I really appreciate that. It's a lot of fun. Um, I can't be there for those stories, but you were. So uh, it's wonderful for you to share them with us. Uh, actually meeting Reginald Jones, uh, having a chat with him, experiencing chaff falling from the air <laughs> as it's being developed. This is new stuff to me. I hadn't heard of the pill. Uh, you know, it's you study World War II and you see the submarines doing very well uh, early on in 41 and then things start to go bad for them. And uh, this is part of the reason why. They, they could be picked up. Uh, and I think the, the development of uh, that, that kind of radar, sonar, and, and hedgehogs uh, really turned things around. So that's, that's awesome. Um, I, I really am looking forward to uh, your, your return to look at the technical side of things here. But sharing the stories of how electronic warfare as a field developed. And I, I really hope that folks listening or watching get this idea of the cat and mouse, um, this escalation, right? We do this, you figure out a way around it, we figure out a way around that. And, and maybe uh, you have to scrap the whole thing, like that first uh, the, the system based on the Lorenz um, patterns there. That got thrown out after a while because the Germans figured out what the British were doing. Um, and you know this, I'm just sharing this for, for uh, you know, all the, the folks listening or watching. Then um, they actually developed a new system the Germans did with uh, three lines of uh, cross beams that were named after rivers in Europe. And these, these beams were set, the lead plane, by the way, was the only one that got this, the rest were following, because it was difficult to do. Um, and so the lead plane would know, it would cross the first line and that was sort of, hey, pay attention. The second, I think, would open the bomb bay doors or arm the bombs. And then the third uh, line cross beam automatically dropped the bombs. So they had really got this stuff figured out um, by that point. And then of course the, uh, the British figured it out again. So in the description of the video on YouTube here or, or on Anchor, I'm going to link to uh, Bruce's channel so you can go watch some of his videos there. Uh, I'm gonna link to the Battle of the Beams Wikipedia article, which is the most entertaining thing, <laughs> besides us talking about it, of course, uh, that I have read in quite a while. I just sort of stumbled across it while I was doing my research one evening and I read it out to a friend of mine who happened to be there. And he said, wow, I would pay to see this as a movie because <laughs> there's, all this, there's all this conflict, right? The RAF is saying, we don't care. Uh, initially, right, when, when Reginald Jones is trying to get attention on this. Uh, I believe the British did not have a, ra uh, a radio to be able to pick up that frequency, so he had to run out to the high street and buy an American radio uh, to give to <laughs> the folks going up in the plane to listen for those signals. Um, and, and there's just this great uh, back and forth story written down in there that we've, uh, that we've introduced to you uh, today. So, um, Bruce, uh, let's hold up the book again uh, to give folks a chance to see it. And we'll do that again in the, in the next episode. Okay. It's called The Spirit of Attack. And if you want to get a copy of that, um, you can get it on Amazon or as Bruce said, uh, go back to the beginning of the slides. Uh, I'll, I'll drop the address in the description of the video or the audio for folks who uh, are listening and can't see. Um, and you save yourself the 10 bucks. It looks like a nice high quality thing. And I'm sure the stories in there are interesting. I'll probably pick up a copy myself. Um, wh where should people go to learn more about you or connect with you if they want? Is, it, is the YouTube channel the best place? Yes, I'm on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And uh, please call it Spirit of Attack. Right. And 
that's where I put my videos. I can handle Facebook better than I can handle YouTube. Mm. For some reason, I don't understand how YouTube works, but I publish, I publish all of them also on YouTube. So that if you go on YouTube and look at uh, Bruce Gordon uh, and the subject, you'll find it. But it's not as easy as going to Facebook and looking under spirit of attack and going to videos and going down below. That's the best way to do it. Okay, great. I have more than 20 videos there. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, my book is filled with pictures. Um, I, that's one of Korea, I don't know, that's one where we had uh, an F-102 flying over Kansas City unmanned and there was not a drone, the pilot had bailed out. Okay, lots of stories and then lots from uh, Korea and uh, Vietnam. So over, over 100 pictures there. Excellent. I, I think they enjoy it. Mm-hmm. All right, sir. Stories, yes. Right. All right. Well, my guest has been Major Bruce Gordon, uh, electronic warfare instructor and combat pilot himself. Uh, we'll be back for another interview where we'll get into the technical side, uh, look at the electromagnetic spectrum and how countermeasures work. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Thanks for doing this, Bruce. Thank you very much, Jason. Hey, this is Jason Canigan, the host of the program. Thanks a lot for listening to the Cold Star Project. If you want me to send you new episodes of the Cold Star Project so that you don't have to go hunting around for them or watching YouTube or anything like that, go to this page, coldstartech.com slash MSB. That's short for Make Space Boring, which is what we're all about. And uh, drop in your email address there, and I will be able to do that for you. Make Space Boring is another little show that I run. It's a shorter format, quick interviews, and uh, news of the day, and sometimes an update of who I'm meeting and what I'm learning in the space field. It's on the same Cold Star Tech channel. Speaking of which, on the YouTube channel, I can do something I cannot do on the audio-only version, which is add playlists. And so there may be topic area playlists on the YouTube channel that you would be interested in digging into and going down the rabbit hole and learning uh, more about. For example, space law and policy, space situational awareness, the lunar mining and construction and fun stuff like that. So go check that out. Uh, that is at coldstartech.com slash play. That's the short link to get there. Anyway, thanks for listening and I look forward to talking to you soon.